Okay. Um, hope everybody is doing well. Um, I have two uh, sort of DNA pieces, a heavy chain, um, and one of the ways I know it's a heavy chain is because I have little H's <laughs> next to a lot of the gene segments. Um, and a light chain, they have little L's. Um, I also know the heavy chain is a heavy chain because it has D's in it. Um, and heavy chain has D's, and I know the heavy chain constant regions. But in any case, um, we'll see some of that in more detail today. So those are just there for our reference today. Um, and I also want to um, make sure, or just sort of remind you, I guess, um, you have two problem sets due next week. One of them is about VDJ recombination. Um, it is due on Monday by 5 p.m. Um, you will have all of the information you need by the end of today, at least that is my goal, um, to be able to do that problem set. Um, in fact, these drawings that I have on the board are partial answers towards one of them, though they are still missing things. They would not yet get full credit because I haven't taught you the final thing <laughs> that they need. Um, and um, so that's posted on Moodle. You also have a, a problem set about immunology techniques, specifically a technique called flow cytometry um, that is due on Friday next week by five. Um, that problem set is also posted and we're gonna be talking about that technique on Friday. Um, so just be aware that all of those are posted. You, um, and in both cases, the due dates are set in the way that they are so that you can potentially have time to come talk to me in office hours. Um, so please take a look at those things and come talk to me because I'm happy to talk to you and help as much as you might like. So today we're going to continue thinking about aspects of generation of antibody diversity. Um, though I will generally be um, shorthanding that as um, BDJ recombination. Recombination, of course, is when DNA is cut and re-ligated together to make a new combo. Recombination. Um, and we specifically kind of saw this big picture version of the process where we see each B cell recombining um, a V, D, and J segments. Um, and choosing, I say this as though it was like an active choice, it's not really an active choice, um, a different V, a different potential D, a different J, to make a different receptor. Um, this process is totally random. Students don't like it when I say that. They're like, but it's not really random, is it? Yes, it's random. For your purposes, it is random. We can have all sorts of arguments, and I've had all sorts of arguments in classes about various details of this. Random. Go with random. Um, so we kind of thought about this process where we're getting diversity by combining mini gene segments or combinatorial diversity. And we saw some of the benefits of this. First of all, because we are combining a heavy chain and a light chain um, and we need that combination to bind antigen, that helps us um, cut down the number of genes we needed we need because we are combining um, those two different things. And then in the heavy chain, we use a V, a D, and a J segment. Like I said, one thing I know about my drawing is that the one with the D is the heavy chain. So I know that must be a heavy chain. Even if I didn't write little H's <laughs> um, next to everything. And there are about 45 uh, V's in the human genome, 23 D's, 6 J's. And so if you multiply that out, we have 6,210 possible heavy chains we can make um, out of, what is that, 68, 74 genes, you get 6,000 uh, heavy chains. So we're, we're saving uh, quite a lot there genetically. Um, with light chain, we are only using a V and a J. There are two different kinds of light chains, kappa or, and lambda. A B cell uses one or the other. My little drawing one, I wrote kappa as my constant region. C 
because there's no great reason why I would pick one or the other, but I just picked one. Um, and if we look at the numbers of light chains, we can get um, 370 when we combine kappa and lambda. And if we take 370 and multiply it by the number of heavy chains, we get 2.3 times 10 to the 6, or 2.3 uh, million different antibodies we can make out of you know, a couple hundred gene segments. So um, we saw this nice benefit. This is also showing you those same loci. This is sort of um, your textbook's version of the drawing that I have made on the board. Um, you can see that the heavy chain is on chromosome 14. You can see that the light chain is on chromosome 22. Light chain lambda, light chain kappa is on chromosome 2. You can see all of those Vs, Ds, and Js lined up here. Um, so this sort of gives you uh, another idea of this. Um, and here you can kind of see some parts of this process. So I'm going to show you one other piece that is key in terms of thinking about um, these uh, drawings as well that sort of corresponds with what is being shown here. Um, so the idea that you can see here is that first we've got our germline DNA. That's the DNA in every single cell of the body, including the not immune cells. In this one B cell, we have chosen a particular V, a particular D, and a particular J, and we have done this recombination process to cut out the intervening DNA. So the DNA that was in between gets cut out. The DNA outside remains the same. So to give you an example of this, if we imagine my B cell here choosing VH2, DH2, and JH2, I guess it likes the number two, and I were to draw what the DNA looks like afterwards, You could see that I would put the three pieces that I've joined together directly touching each other, because that's how they get put. Um, but you can also see everything to the outside stays the same. So we, we're picking VH2, VH1 stays there, because it wasn't in between. So only the in between stuff gets cut out. And JH3 wasn't in between, it didn't get cut out, it stays, as do all those constant region things. Um, same thing if I were to choose the uh, L3, JL2, all of the DNA on the outsides would remain. Um, and so you can see that in both cases here. You can also see it he here, although it's not drawn as well because they don't show us a bunch of options for Vs and a bunch of options for Ds and a bunch of options for Js. Then we can eventually transcribe this area of the chromosome, and we will do some um, splicing of the DNA, and when we do the splicing, we'll finally get rid of all the junk we didn't need. So if I were to draw the final RNA of this, I might draw this. 
say if it was just making IgM and using the IgM constant region. Now we get rid of all the other stuff in the final RNA. So we've got the original DNA, the recombined DNA, and the final RNA. Um, and similarly here, it would be just EL3, just JL2, and Kappa. And so you can sort of see that being processed here into our final mRNA. FYI, I'm going to be editing those more later. So I, it, there's going to be, I'll tell you when I'm, they're finally done that you could take a picture of. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you can see that we translate this to make our um, heavy chain. This process happens twice in the life of the B cell, once to make a heavy chain and once to make a light chain. And it's really the same set of steps for making the light chain that it is for making the heavy chain. One question that students will sometimes ask me here is, well, what if for some reason we, you know, I showed you in my little drawing the final RNA, but the original RNA is pretty much the same as the recombined DNA. Like, what if we had the RNA that com corresponded to this thing? We didn't do the splicing and stuff yet. What, or what if for some reason we'd made a big ginormous RNA that was like this whole thing? <laughs> the, the cell just did that for some reason. Um, or why doesn't the cell do that for some reason? Why does the cell only do transcription here when we've done recombination and not up here before we've done recombination? Could we get some gigantic Franken protein? <laughs> with all these pieces together. Sometimes students ask some things about that. Um, and a piece of this that I want you to realize um, is that there are little promoter elements in front of each of the variable regions, but none of those promoters are really good enough to start transcription by themselves. They all need a little bit of help from an enhancer. And that enhancer is at the end of this piece of DNA. The promoter and the enhancer are too far apart <laughs> at the beginning. So any cell that's not a B cell, any cell that doesn't cut this DNA and bring that promoter and enhancer closer together is never going to be able to do transcription here. And thus, there's never going to be anything to translate. It's only when you actually cut out all of this intervening middle DNA and make it shorter that the promoter and enhancer are close enough together that we can just get an mRNA made and we can eventually get um, a transcript. So in fact, that shortening is quite important in this process. But we can come back to this exact um, issue that we looked at before, and we have to realize one other thing. In this um, table, we got to about 2 million different antibody combos from a couple hundred genes. And that's pretty good. But if you remember when I introduced this problem of the antibody diversity problem last time, I didn't tell you that we made 2 times 10 to the 6th or 2 million antibodies. I told you we made about 10 to the 16th antibodies. And different people will have different numbers there. The moral of the story is it's a number that's still way bigger than 10 to the 6th. So this pairing together of a heavy and light chain, which is really making a combo, combinatorial diversity, 
And this pairing together of a V, D, and a J, which is making a combo, combinatorial diversity, isn't actually enough. That can't be the whole answer of how we get to this huge number. It ends up being part of the same process, but we can kind of think of this other little piece of the process that helps us get from this 2 times 10 to the 6th up until the final giant number. Um, I will also say that um, this is not the place I thought I'd put this slide. That's okay. Um, <laughs> When we talked about the structure of the antibody, I told you about the CDRs, or complementarity determining regions. They're the things that are actually making contact with the antigen on both the heavy and the light chain, and they are the places that are the most variable in the variable region. Um, so we can think about how those sort of are related to VDJ recombination. Um, the uh, CDR1 is actually just encoded as part of the V. So whichever V that cell chooses, that determines what the CDR1 looks like. CDR2 is also encoded within the V, and that's true for both the heavy chain and the light chain. CDR3, however, is actually encoded by the junction between the gene segments. So CDR3 of the heavy chain includes parts of the V, D, and J. CDR3 of the light chain can, includes both the V and the J, right, these sort of junction regions. So those are going to be completely unique and special for each different B cell based on the combo that was made. So all the B cells that choose VH27 will have the same CDR1 and CDR2, but they'll still have unique CDR3s because they made unique junctions. Okay, now my numbers problem. <laughs> How are we gonna get from 2 million to say 10 to the 16th or something like that? It's still the same process that we've been seeing, which I'm gonna, you're gonna be hearing me say a lot today as cut and paste, <laughs> where we're gonna cut the DNA and paste it back together. But the other piece to this is that when we do that pasting, when we put the DNA back together, so we're putting the DNA together and making a junction, we get some additional diversity at the junction. Thus we call it junctional diversity. And specifically we do that by adding and subtracting some base pairs. Another way of saying that is that the joining or the junction is imprecise. So we don't take the original base pairs we had and add them together perfectly. We can add or subtract some base pairs, and that gives us the additional diversity that we need. And so, that, of course, you can imagine that's also going to really impact CDR3 um, quite a bit since it's being encoded in that junction region. You can see this here as well. So this is the actual sequence in pink of uh, VK21, and this is the sequence in yellow of JK1, so these are V and a J for a light chain. And this could be what we see in four different B cells who picked VK21 and JK1 in terms of what sequence they actually ligated together. And so you can notice that cell line number one cut some stuff off. It didn't actually use all of VK1. It lost some base pairs. And I think it lost some base pairs over here too. Yeah, it did. Um, there also are situations where they can add base pairs. And you can see even these, these four cells that chose the same V and same J can end up with slightly different antibodies because of differences in how many base pairs they added or subtracted when pasting together the two different pieces. And that is known as junctional diversity. And so it's actually because of both combinatorial diversity and then that extra variation that comes from junctional diversity that we get to our big number, whatever big number we're using. This textbook uses to the 13th instead of the 16th. I don't care. Um, 
the, mor the moral of the story is that junctional diversity is kind of giving us the rest of that diversification on top. Um, when we looked at the difference between innate and adaptive immunity earlier, we usually had something that said something like diversity. Um, and innate immunity said, would say something like a limited number of conserved germline encoded receptors. That just means there's some receptors and they're encoded by normal old genes and nothing fancy happens. And with adaptive immunity, it says highly diverse, a large number of receptors arising from genetic recombination of receptor genes in an individual. What that actually means is that part of how we define adaptive immunity is that adaptive immune cells do VDJ recombination. This is like fancy words for VDJ recombination earlier in the textbook before they told you what VDJ recombination is. And this is like fancy words that say not VDJ recombination before they told you what VDJ recombination is. Um, so that's actually the difference and the, the, this definitional difference between innate and adaptive immune, immune responses. Um, and if you look at any table I showed you in some of those earlier days where it's con um, comparing and contrasting innate and adaptive immunity, it will say something super weird about diversity and it's because it's trying to say VDJ without saying VDJ because it didn't tell you what VDJ was yet. Um, and in fact, VDJ recombination is um, a really interesting um, process that we know evolved about uh, 550 million years ago. Um, when, uh, and it comes in right here at this split, um, which is the split between uh, jawed fishes and other organisms. And so all jawed fishes, jawed fish and be beyond have the ability to do VDJ recombination and have adaptive immune systems. And organisms that evolved before um, jawed vertebrates or jawed fish um, do not have adaptive immune systems. And so it's a very clear cutoff line um, with the jawed vertebrates um, that they all have the ability to do VDJ recombination. And I could geek out about that at such length because it's the coolest thing ever but I'm probably not going to have time, but it's so cool. Um, there is also one, uh, there are a bunch of things that are potential problems we can think about that relate to VDJ recombination. Um, both this slide and the next slide sort of are highlighting this same problem. And I want to be very clear about what the problem is because it's going to become important when we talk about some of the other parts of the steps later. So I want you to imagine for a second that, you know, you, we're thinking about v, you know, VDJ recombination, this process, and you were trying to explain it to um, someone who doesn't have much of a science background or potentially someone who is currently taking Bio 250 with Dr. Benoit there would be something they would not like about this process. There would be something that would upset them about VDJ recombination. There's a problem with VDJ recombination where there's a certain point where you hear it and you're like, wait, excuse me, what? What's the problem? Where, what is it, where are you like, oh, wait, 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 what? With this whole business. I'm going to go back to another slide because it kind of highlights it, but just think about what's the problem? Here. Yeah, Josh. So you're losing some DNA. Yeah, but even simpler than that. So yes, you're potentially losing DNA. What would Dr. Dunaway yell an awful lot about in Bio 250 and be like, ah! I mean, he knows this process, so he, like, he knows that it works and he knows why it works and all that. But what, in, at least in a very basic molecular biology discussion, would really disagree with things he teaches, you guys? Yeah, Emma. Uh, nope, so we're going to come to that. 
what happens, according to Dr. Dunaway, if you have a mutation in your DNA? You get dead, right? He says you get dead. Any change to your DNA is you get dead, according to Dr. Dunaway, right? I just told you all of your B cells cut their DNA. Actively, on purposely cut their DNA and then pasted it. Um, what? <laughs> there is a process where your cells are purposely cutting up their DNA? So what's the problem here? Why, why do people sometimes hear this and be like, no, 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 I don't like this. This is not a good idea. What's the problem? Yeah, Grace. So somehow we've got to think about how does it know where and when to cut? And that's exactly where we're going as we talk about enzymes and really molecular mechanisms. But why is it important that it knows where and when to cut? Yeah, Tara. What, if, what, would ha what might happen if it cuts the wrong thing? Maybe, maybe it, you could cut the wrong, it could cut the wrong thing and it could kill the cell. Maybe it could cut the wrong thing and you end up with cancer. You can imagine if this goes wrong, it goes real wrong. <laughs> yeah, Michaela. Yeah. So Michaela wants to know if the order can be VJD. And we're gonna see, we're gonna come to that. And I'm gonna, I'm, at one point when I draw something, I'm gonna ask you, if, okay? So be ready to, for me to turn that question back on you. Okay. Um, so this figure is actually sh showing a bunch of different types of leukemias and lymphomas. Every single one that's on here is a type of B cell that messed up BDJ recombination. And so, or it got messed up at a different stage of the B cell's life. I guess theoretically it could have messed up something else, but usually, often there's a VDJ issue. Um, in fact, if you look at all of the sort of types of the parts of the body that have cancers, well, you find like skin cancer is really common. Well, yeah, it's because the skin is exposed to things like UV light a lot. Like you can imagine most of the, the things that are high on the list of tissues with cancers are things that are involved like next to the external environment, but also the immune system. And the reason is because all of your lymphocytes are breaking their DNA. And so sometimes that can go wrong. So here you can see some um, examples on that. This is actually a really famously named, known chromosome where sometimes um, when the heavy chain breaks, so when it gets cut, it can sometimes actually paste onto the wrong chromosome instead of pasting, instead of the yellow pasting back onto the yellow. Sometimes it will paste onto a different chromosome, like the blue, as you see here. Um, when that happens, that ends up being something known as the Philadelphia chromosome that gets made, this um, mixed up chromosome. And it's commonly found in um, some leukemias and lymphomas as well. Um, so what I want you to know is that as we go through the nitty gritty details of how this is regulated and really how this works, sometimes students are like, oh, this is so painful. Why do I have to know all these nitty gritty details? Well, your cells better know those nitty gritty details because if they don't, really bad outcomes happen. Um, and so this is something to just be aware of that the regulation of this process is super, super important. All right, so here's our process. Um, so if we're going to actually regulate it and we're going to sort of think about it in detail, um, Grace, you mentioned a, a little bit ago some things we're gonna, the cell needs to know. What were the th things the cell needs to know? Where, Where to cut and when to cut, right? So we're going to need a, a, some mark that says cut here and not some other part of the DNA. We're going to need to know when. Um, what else are we going to need to make this actually work? Don't overthink this. Real easy. If we're going to cut and paste, what else do we need? What is it? I, I kind of saw what you said. So a ligase to paste things back together. So you're going to need something to do with some pasting. You're going to need one other thing.
Yeah. What is it? What, what do you think, Josh? You're, you're going to need some enzyme to do the cutting, right? So you're going to need something that could cut. You're going to need something that's going to paste. You're going to need some way to know where. And you're going to need some way to know when if you want to make this work. And that is where, really where a lot of these proteins that are important in VDJ recombination come in. I am going to talk a lot about RAG1 and RAG2. I'm going to talk about TDT. I'm going to talk about Artemis. Um, I'm really just going to say the ligase here, or like polymerases for these other ones. RAG, TDT, and Artemis are the ones I'm going to highlight um, in this discussion. Otherwise, like I said, I'm going to say polymerase and ligase um, in this process. So the first part of the process is going back to Grace's comment of we need to know where to cut. So if you're going to design this whole business, how do you design where to cut? Can you put a post-it note on the DNA? Do you, do you think the enzyme use, looks for a post-it note? No. So what does the enzyme look for? What are the options that the enzyme could look for? Yeah, Alexis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe some kind of marker. Okay, yeah. It has to be a nucleotide sequence. It has to be a specific set of base pairs that marks this is a good cutting spot. The name of that sequence is the recombination signal sequence, or RSS. There are two kinds of RSSs. They each have first this conserved seven base pair sequence, known as the heptamer, or C-A-C-A-G-T-G. -G. I certainly don't have that memorized now. I was looking at some old, an old exam I took. Apparently, once upon a time, I did. I don't, I don't know. Then there's a random set of base pairs. And the, ra the, the letters don't matter, but the amount does. Specifically, it's 23. And sometimes we call this a 23 RSS, or a 23 base pair spacer. And then there's a conserved sequence of nine base pairs, which is the nonomer, A, C, A, 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 C, C. <laughs> and so there's these seven, any 23, these nine. Alternatively, we can have a 12 base pair spacer. It's the same seven in the heptamer, but then it's 12 random bases. Then it's the same nonomer. Oftentimes, we draw these as little triangles. And you can see that they're drawn as two different color triangles. Um, and so it's important to know when you're thinking about RSSs that there always have to be two different kinds. I'm not always going to get like super picky that you know which one is 12 and which one is 23 in different cases. But you should know like one kind versus another kind. And you could, like I said, you can see them drawn here as triangles. Note that the heptamer sequence is immediately adjacent to the uh, gene segment. So like the next base pair is part of J, or the next base pair is part of V. You'll see that in my drawing um, that I do in a little bit. That was the thing that's an issue here, is I need RSSs for this to be complete. And I haven't drawn my RSSs yet. Um, if you look at the spacer numbers, what do you notice about those numbers for the spacers? The two numbers you see for the spacers. Simple math. Simple, very simple. It's almost like a number and twice as much. It turns out that 12 base pairs is basically one time around the helix. And 24 is, or 23 is two times around. So there are some times where people will call it a one-turn spacer and a two-turn spacer. The basic idea is that there's the heptamer, and then you go all the way around once, and then there's a nonomer. So like if you were an enzyme, you could grab them really easily, because they were exactly 
next to each other. Or here, it's two turns. Um, and so it's really about the, like I said, not about the bases, but about the spacing. Um, so the key thing to know about RSSs is that RSSs work by something known as the 1223 rule. What that means is that you can only combine something with a 12 to something with a 23. You can't put a 12 and a 12 together. You can't put a 23 and a 23 together. You got to put a 12 and a 23 together. This version from your textbook shows you some RSSs, but it, kinda, it doesn't show them as triangles. It just shows them with all the numbers. I'm going to draw them up here as triangles. OK? So what you can see is that in the case of my heavy chain, the V has a 23. We'll make 23 be scribbled in. So you can see my V23 RSS is exactly touching. There's no space. My uh, V segment, and it's the scribbly kind. <laughs> and this one also has one. And this one also has one. And you know what? This guy, when we didn't cut it out, still has it. Um, my D has two RSSs, one on either end, and they're both 12s. So they're always going to be open. So there's my Ds. And my J has a 23. And this one that didn't get lost here still has it. So this is what it actually looks like. And this is how I would actually draw <laughs> this whole process. Um, you will notice that with the light chain, in the case of lambda, the V's got the, 12, the 23, the J has the 12. It's flipped in the case of kappa. This is why I don't care that you know which one is 12 and which one is 23. But what you should know is that V has one kind. And J has one kind in the light chain. And you should know that the V and J has the same one in the heavy chain. D has a different one on either side. So here and the ones I didn't cut out. So that would actually be the complete drawing uh, of that drawing. Um, if you want to take a picture, now is a good time to take the picture. Just because so many of you are taking it earlier, I figured I should turn it out. This slide is another way of showing that same thing. Um, you can see that there are different V12 uh, and 23 on the light chains. The heavy chain has uh, the 23 on both the V and the J um, and the 12s together. So, Michaela, can you go V to J and then D? Could you? No, why not? Yeah, so there actually would be two problems in that for the heavy chain. If we wanted to put V with J, we can't because they both have 23. They don't match. We've got to put a D in between. The other thing that would happen somehow if the cell did that is if it tried to join a V and a J, it would delete all the Ds. <laughs> so it couldn't like add a D again later because all the Ds are in between and they'd all get deleted. So that would be sad. Um, and so this actually enforces that it's a V, a D, and a J in the heavy chain, and a V and a J in the light chain. So you're not going to get like V, V, or V, D, 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 J, or V, D, J, J, J. You always have to do V, D, J because of the 1223 rule. 
Um, oh, look, it's the same thing um, showing again. One other piece to know is that with the light chain, it's really just the one recombination. With the heavy chain, this is actually two recombination events. First, we take D and join it to J. Then we put V on with DJ. So you can see that first we've picked a D and a J. We've done the rearrangement there. And then we rearrange the V to that DJ that has been made. So it's happening in a, as a two-step process. There's only one rearrangement that has to be made in the light chain. So it's only one step. Um, when we do this, it is the area between the RSSs that gets deleted. So in my heavy chain example, we joined DH2 and we joined JH2. That means the DNA that got deleted was all of this DNA in between, including the RSSs. So it's it's right there from the RSS. The RSS starts to get deleted and all DNA in between up to that other RSS. Same thing in this situation. It was the RSS all the way to this RSS. That whole piece of DNA got deleted. So the region between the RSSs is deleted. So now we actually have to think about how this happens and what this really looks like. Um, and the first part of how this works is that there are enzymes that recognize the RSS. So we, kn we now know what the marker is. We now know how the cell knows what to be looking for. And specifically, the cell is going to use these enzymes um, called RAG1 and RAG2 to bind to the RSS. And so you can see RAG1 and RAG2 binding to an RSS here. And you can see the DNA kind of um, curving around so that the other RSS can be bound. So you can imagine RAG1 and RAG2, technically they are two proteins, two separate proteins, but they work together in a complex. So you can kind of think of them as one big blue blob. They grab on to some 12 and to some 23. Like there's a space for a 12, a space for a 23. RSSs grab one of each. And you sort of see that in this image too. Here's RAG1 and RAG2. They've grabbed on to this 12 and this 23 and hold them together. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. But then officially, RAG1 is really the one that does the recognizing. Then we have the next step here. And the next step is in sort of the specific details of it are important. Now, RAG2 specifically creates something called a DNA NIC. So this is specifically a DNA NIC. A DNA NIC means that it is a single-stranded break. So we're not going to just break across both strands. We're just breaking one strand, what the NIC means. And you can see the NIC happening right here. That NIC is happening exactly at the border between the RSS and whichever gene segment we're looking at. So because uh, I think it's heptamer is right next to the segment, it'd actually be like right after the heptamer. One other thing to note here is that in this image, in many images, in pretty much all the images I show you, you see this happening at the V region, and you don't see the NIC happening at the J region. In reality, there are two NICs. There's a NIC at V and a NIC at J happening here. And this whole process I'm going to be telling you is kind of happening at V and at J. But if we tried to draw that many things happening all at once, it would be messy and super confusing. So we usually just draw it happening at one gene segment. Like here, we're just showing you V. We've like zoomed in on what's going on at V. The same things are going on at J. It's just too much drawing and too much to look at. 
So there were actually two Nicks, but we're only going to follow the fate of one Nick. And we can see that Nick here as well. So now we're zoomed in a little bit more on our DNA Nick. We've got one DNA strand that's intact. Nothing bad has happened to it. And we've got our one strand that has a Nick. We've broken it. And we've broken it specifically between the 3 prime OH and the 5 prime phosphate. So now we have a free 3 prime OH, 3 prime hydroxyl, and a free 5 prime phosphate in this DNA. That 3 prime OH, that 3 prime hydroxyl, does not like to be free. It's not appreciate being free. It's not good. And as a result, that free 3 prime hydroxyl performs a nucleophilic attack because it would like to be bound. Specifically, it performs a nucleophilic attack on the phosphate on the opposite strand. And so it attacks the other strand, making this little hairpin. So now you can see the top strand of the DNA has attacked and joined itself to the bottom strand, and we made this little like U, it's called a hairpin. And now we've got these two other pieces that are just floating around free. The hairpin part is on the V, or the D, or the J, whatever gene segment we're talking about. It's going to be on the part that we're going to not throw away, we're going to keep, and that's eventually going to code for the antibody. So sometimes we call that the coding end, or the coding joint. The part that now has this um, both sides broken is the RSS part. And so we call it the signal end or the signal joint, because it's the RSS. So now, remember how I told you before, we're only drawing the V, but there's really stuff going on at V and J? Well, now we have two signal joints and two coding joints. One of V, one of like each. That would get really confusing to draw. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to say what happens to the signal joints. Then after we deal with what happens to the signal joints, we'll come back to say what happens to the coding joints to kind of keep our uh, stuff straight. The signal joint is really easy. We have these two signal joints. So here you can see this signal joint here. With the RSS here, you can see the signal joint here. It's basically like a double-stranded piece of DNA that's broken. Here you can see it again, double-stranded DNA that's broken with the two signal joints. And you can see all that intervening DNA in the middle. Um, here you can see my two signal ends. Um, ligase joins them together. The end. That's it. Ligase just takes those two ends that have been made and joins them together, and we're done. We get this little circle of DNA with this nice, precise, perfect joining, and you just get this random piece of DNA that's going to float around the cell, and we do not care about it at all anymore. So a signal joint, easy. The problem, or the harder part, is the coding joint, and what exactly happens at the coding joint. The way we deal with the coding joint introduces new base pairs. So, that, so we can add or subtract base pairs in the process that deals with the coding joint. And so the way that we're dealing with the coding joint is really how we get our junctional diversity. Because the way we deal with that weird hairpinny thing gives us some new bases or subtracts some bases and allows us to now have our junctional diversity. And this all comes from our hairpin that has formed. I'm going to check one quick thing. OK. Um, I'm going to draw some DNA sequence. And we're going to think a little bit about this. This is, this is very 
important chemistry that I'm drawing. You can tell that Dr. Cassano would look at this and be like, oh yeah, that's perfect chemistry. So the blue is a phosphodiester bond, right? It's the kind of bond that holds together DNA bases. So when we made our NIC, we had a free 3' prime hydroxyl here. And that 3' prime hydroxyl attacked this phosphate. So when we made our hairpin, what we actually made was we made that, another phosphodiester bond right there. So we're going to have to open the phosphodiester bond somehow in order to do some ligation. Um, in fact, when I was an undergrad, we learned it opens by magic because we didn't know the, we didn't actually understand the enzyme then, but we understand the enzyme now. What does the enzyme have to be? What reaction does that enzyme have to have to perform right now? You can get it from my from my very important drawing. What reaction does the enzyme probably have to perform at this point? Yeah, Josh? Yeah, so what's it gonna what's it gonna cut? It it wants to cut a phosphodiester bond, right? Okay. Do enzymes have brains? No. The problem is the enzyme is kind of this big blobby thing here. And the enzyme has to cut a phosphodiester bond, but it actually can't tell the difference between each of these phosphodiester bonds. It needs to cut a phosphodiester bond, but it actually doesn't know which one to cut. And so we're going to have this enzyme come and it's going to cut. Um, to sort of address the, the place where this gets a little weird, it, it has to cut here. It actually can cut up to five base pairs in either direction. So you can imagine sort of the size of the enzyme and the fact that it's bound here doesn't mean it cuts anywhere it wants in the whole genome. But it's cutting up to five base pairs in either direction here. And so you can see options on this slide. So we have this enzyme known as Artemis that is going to make the cut. It's possible that Artemis could do could cut the right bond. And if Artemis cut the right bond, then we end up with A T C G A T A G, C, T. Exactly what we started with, right? It's also possible that Artemis can cut other places. And I'm going to draw the most sort of some dramatic other places. <laughs> I'm not going to draw every single possibility here because that would take a long time. But let's imagine Artemis cut this bond by accident instead of that bond. If Artemis did that, it would end up making this kind of DNA. So all of these parts would be now looped down to the bottom strand. And so you see how I got that? I just went T and then I went A and I went around. You could also imagine Artemis could cut here. And if it did that, it would make this. So again, we have this whole extra strand. And you can see these differences in the openings and the overhang listed here. Now, if ligase, 
tried to ligate two hairpins that were not opened, it would never work. The cell would, would basically fail and the cell would die. And the person would have no B cells and actually no T cells as well. And that would be very sad for them. Um, if they did that, they would have an immunodeficiency and they would probably die as a child. Um, thus, this enzyme, when it was found, it was named after the Greek goddess of protector of children because it protects children from having immunodeficiency. And that Greek goddess's name is Artemis. Um, ligase could also try to ligate this business together. Sort of easy to imagine how ligase deals with this blunt-ended thing, right? But it's a little harder to imagine how ligase deals with these. And in reality, what happens is that before we do any ligation, a polymerase comes along and fills in any gaps. And so a polymerase, in this case, would fill in That. In this case, a polymerase would fill in this. You see how I got that? I just did the base pairing. If you look at this, um, there are two things to notice. This was what the original chromosome had. Here's what the original chromosome had. Here's what the original chromosome had. This is four base pairs that have gotten added in that this B cell has uniquely to itself as a result of this process that no other cell in the body has. This is new sequence that got added as a result of this process. Similarly, here is the original. We got some sequence added as a result of this process. So, world's easiest participation points. Who wants to participate very, very, very easily? All right, John, you're, you're the only one that raised your hand, so go for it. So, all right, so, no, don't worry, you got this. All right, so if we look at this top strand and we read from five prime to three prime, the, the newly added base pairs, what are they? Yes. Now we look at the bottom strand and we go five prime to three prime. Remember, five prime's over here. What are we going to get? What do you notice about the things you just said? It was, it was the same going opposite directions, right? Do you know what that means? That word, there's a word for that if we're thinking about the English language. Like sometimes people use the phrase. I don't know why this is the only one I can think of. So some people use the phrase, madam, I'm Adam. So if you read it forwards, it says the same thing as if you read it backwards. There's actually a word for that in the English language. Do you guys know what that word is? It's a palindrome. These, base, these new base pairs that just got added as a result of this process, we call P nucleotides for palindromic nucleotides. That's actually, the P is because we're saying they're a palindrome. And so they're all happening as a result of that palindrome. You can see here our, um, that we are generating our hairpins. You can see that we had asymmetric hairpin opening. And thus, we had to add in some new nucleotides, our P nucleotides. Um, I'm also going to draw this here. Um, it's the same process. I'm actually going to draw it in a slightly different way than I have it here on the slides. Um, and again, you can see that I've got a V and a J. Technically, I'm going to have two NICs, but that's just too much drawing, so I'm not gonna draw all the NICs. See, and one of them went away. 
and then I'm going to have my three prime hydroxyl attack <laughs> there, and I'm going to end up with this. Um, and I could imagine getting, um, you know, a lot of different places where Artemis could cut. So one option is that Artemis can cut like this. Yeah? And then we would fill in and we would get some P nucleotides. I'm going to come back to this drawing in a little bit. See, this one I made super repetitive, so it was obvious it was a palindrome. Um, we still haven't ligated together our coding joint yet. We still don't have our DNA pasted back together. There are two other things that happen here before we ligate. One of them, I'm going to say, this happens. And then I'm going to say, if you look at examples on exams, I never ask you about this. But, I, but if we are being complete, it does happen. <laughs> Which is that sometimes you can have a nuclease cut up base pairs and remove some. So sometimes you can subtract base pairs. All the examples I ever show you are base pairs getting added, but you can have some subtracted as well. You also have some additional base pairs that can get added. These base pairs are completely random. They are added by this really cool polymerase called TDT that just picks up whatever random base pair it finds and shoves it on the end. So TDT could come to this DNA that I made. Here is our you know, original sequence that was in the genome. You can see my P nucleotides that got added. And it could add some Cs, just because it felt like it. And those would also get complemented. As I mentioned, those base pairs are totally random. And so we don't call them P nucleotides. Instead, we call them N nucleotides, the N telling us that they're random. I can look at a sequence. And I can tell which nucleotides that have been added. First, I have to look and say, well, which ones got added and which ones were in the original? And I can circle the, the added ones. I could then go through and look and say, is this a P nucleotide or is this an N nucleotide? Could it have come from binding to the other strand? Is it palindromic or is it not? I knew when I was drawing this that C would be a good choice. Because if this, because this G right here would have been bound to this C. Oh, actually, C is a really bad choice right there. This one's a T. <laughs> um, this A was bound here. This T was bound here. This was bound here. This was bound here. See, I can like just match them up. I can see that they match. And then this next one, I can be like, oh, T doesn't go with G. That's sad. That must be an N nucleotide. Um, if you're going through nucleotides and you start going and you're like P, 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 and you find one that's not a P, you can't then like add more P's afterwards. And that's because N nucleotides get added after the hairpin's already open. So we add P nucleotides, then we add N. Then when we're done, we can finally ligate this whole business together. Um, and so with the coding joint, we are going to get these hairpin ends. We're going to need Artemis to open the ends. We're going to have TDT come in, and then we'll ligate together. And that may add or subtract base pairs to give us our junctional diversity. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about how we limit recombination errors on uh, Friday. Um, you should be able to answer all of the questions on the problem set, except for the very last one right now, because the last one does 
get to what I'm going to be saying next, though I feel like it's something that you can find in the book pretty easily. Um, but it's not due until 5 on Friday, so if or, um, it's, and it's Monday, not even Friday. So you'll definitely hear it on Friday um, before we go into um, thinking about techniques. So I will see you guys on Friday, but you might want to look at that problem set um, as you pretty much are good to go with all of it.